All right. Uh, Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. Beginning at verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, excuse me, I dropped something here. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. This is where I'll stop. There's a lot more that he says there in Matthew 13. But uh, this is kind of the, uh, uh, the last day's kind of message from Jesus, right? Uh, and since he's going to be the one uh, overseeing all that, it's good to hear from him about it. It's kind of a parallel to what we get in Matthew 24, if you want to read that this week. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 are kind of in parallel. They have similar messages about kind of warning signs for his disciples, including us, about kind of how things are going to all work out eventually. Um, this week, uh, I had a weird thing that sparked a thought about this text, and here, here it is. I was turning on to a, a highway here in St. Joseph, uh, leaving my house, getting out of the neighborhood, getting onto the highway, and then I kind of went up uh, a, a, another that, that area where there's uh oh, there's like a loves uh truck stop and there's like arby's and mcdonald's that that place over there just right on the outskirts of south Bay joe well there's some road construction going on there as you know and apparently a big jeep cherokee didn't realize there was road construction going on because when i turned on to the road to go under the underpass he turned onto the same road, but he was going the wrong direction. He was coming right at me. That was not fun. I may have prayed really quickly. You know those quick prayers, like, Lord help me. <laughs> All right? I did one of those really loudly. I was by myself. I had coffee, though, like I do today, and a little of it spilled, I will have to say. And the guy quickly realized, and I stopped just in time for him to kind of move over and get out of my way on back into the, it, was, it goes from four to two, basically. It's supposed to be four lane, but it's two lane for a while because there's construction. And there are signs, there are signs there. And I want, you know, God bless him. I wanted to tell him I didn't have time because I was too busy, you know, trying to survive. But had we had a conversation that day, uh, it may not have gone as kindly as I would have liked, but I, in my best Christian way, I would have tried to say to him, hey, buddy, there are signs there. Uh, that sign is serious. That orange sign that says two lanes, they really mean that when they put those up. Those are for real. They're not just decoration for the holiday. They're not just fall colors. You know what I mean? They're, they're for real. And if you still think it's four just because you want it to be four lanes, you'll be dead wrong if you're not careful. And he and I almost paid the price for him not watching the signs. Now look, I've done that before too. I'll have to confess. I was a little more merciful once my heart started beating again and he went on his way and I went on mine because it happened in a very short amount of time. I thankfully had paper towels, cleaned up the coffee. <laughs> so the coffee that had spilled and my quick breaking and swerving 
and uh, breathed again. And once I breathed again, I remembered that when I first started working downtown in St. Joseph, there are a couple, right where I work, there are a couple of uh, roads that are one way. Right? If you've ever been down there, which I don't recommend. No, I'm just kidding. It's fine. But uh, I've been down, there are a couple of one-way streets. And I remember when I first started working there, maybe the first week I worked downtown. And I hadn't been downtown much at all, even though I've lived in Cameron for a long time. And I've been going to St. Joe for quite a while. But I'd never really been downtown more than a couple of times. Now I was working downtown and parking downtown. And, you know, and, and, and so during a break, I was parked where my building is, and I pulled out, and apparently uh, that particular road, when you pull out that way, uh, is one way. Well, I went one way. It was just the wrong way. And I'm driving, and think I'm in the right lane, and I'm here, I, hear, I see people waving at me, and I'm like, wow, this is friendly down here. I didn't think it was that friendly downtown, but it, it, it was. And I, they're waving, they're, you know, doing this at me. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm waving. I'm in the right lane. I'm thinking I'm, I'm right, right? And then I see a car turning into the same lane from the stoplight up there by the Taco Bell. Everybody knows what that is. And they turn in, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Either they're wrong or I'm wrong, and I happen to glance to my right, and there is a sign that says one way, but it was pointing the other way. So thankfully, there's a big apartment complex there. I don't know if you know, but there, that big apartment complex, I just zoomed into that apartment complex, uh, complex parking lot, put on the brakes, put my car in park, and <sighs> sighed and went, Lord, thank you for rescuing me from this oncoming pickup truck that didn't seem to care that I was going the wrong way. So, I hate when that happens, and I remembered that this last week. Uh, I, I thankfully didn't do that again uh, downtown. But it gave me a little more mercy toward this guy who had, you know, just not read the signs. So Jesus comes along in Mark 13, and he says, Look, I want to give you some signs so, number one, you won't panic when things start to happen. And number two, so that you won't go the wrong way. Still with me? You won't go the wrong way. And so here's a couple things Jesus gives us. I mean, you know, going the wrong way on a one-way street is attention-getting. It can be exciting, but it can also be very deadly, right? It's attention-getting. It's exciting, Maybe that's why people go the wrong way so often in life. They think it's exciting. They they want that adrenaline rush. They they feel that sense of uh, of of excitement for the moment. Uh, but sadly, going the wrong way uh, eventually catches up, right? And so Jesus is lovingly giving warnings to his disciples and to us. Because Jesus knows the context they're in, and he also has this vision of how the kingdom is going to culminate, you know, how things are all going to come together eventually. And so as he teaches his disciples and as he talks about the temple and these great places of worship and the center of, of Jewish life at the time, he uses them as an illustration and says, a couple things. The first thing he says is, uh, don't pursue the wrong kind of power. Uh, if you pursue the wrong kind of power, then you'll be going the wrong way on sort of God's highway. You know what I mean? And it will end up being destructive. Now, he says it's about the temple, and we know the temple gets destroyed, uh, you know, uh, several years later and all that, about 20 or 30 years later after this, 40 years later. But, and, and that's certainly a part of what he's talking about, okay? But there's more to it than that, of course, right? There's this idea of when even religious folks pursue the wrong kind of power, as the religious leaders of his day, many of them, were doing, Right? They were trying to get in good with Herod. They were trying to get in good with Caesar. They were trying to get in good with the powers that be. They were trying to sort of buddy up to them and maintain power, control over the people whom they were supposed to be serving. 
So they're pursuing the wrong kind of power. Jesus says there's power in serving. There's power in sacrificial giving. There's power in love that transcends all earthly powers. We still believe that, right? I mean, that's the, the way that Christ sort of lived his life. He's saying, look, when even religious folks pursue the wrong kind of power, the power based on brute force, the power based on bullying, the power based on just being bigger than the other guy or gal, then you're going the wrong way. And what will eventually happen is not one stone will be left stacked on another. Right? Like, look at this, see this great temple? Yeah, it's nice and big, but right now, Jesus is saying, it's being built on the wrong kind of power. And there will come a time when even this beautiful thing will be crumbled to the ground. Because when you go the wrong way in regard to power, no matter how good it feels in the short term, it ends up destructing, uh, being destructive. I remember uh, we were in Russia in 2008, my whole family. My kids were nine and five. <laughs> and we were strolling around Moscow with two little kids. I mean, they, you know, they were great. But, I mean, it was hot and it was muggy. And we were there on a kind of a mission thing. We were there 17 days. I got to preach in a couple of the small little churches in, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. We got to help with a children's ministry there. We got to help bring some supplies to an orphanage. I mean, we, we did a lot of fun stuff. I mean, hard stuff, but fun stuff. And I got to teach a course there on theology to students who once lived in the Soviet bloc. Now they're learning theology and preparing to be pastors. And so I had 20 students who were learning Christian theology. And it was it's still life-changing to me. It was wonderful. And I remember we had guides there, thankfully. There was a, there's a Nazarene district office there in Moscow. I, I was with the Church of the Nazarene. And so we stayed in that district office, which was really just an apartment. <laughs> and so we'd step on the floor of the apartment. And, you know, every once in a while I had hot water, one of those things. And it was one of those things. And so, uh, you know, market that we walked to that we're, we're, we, we knew like three or four words in Russian because we tried to learn some. Russia, Russia is hard, by the way. Uh, Russian <laughs> is a hard language. And, and thankfully, though, we had our, our district superintendent couple. They spoke both English and Russian. I mean, they were Russian. And <laughs> we had guides, uh, a couple who worked for the district, who were ordained ministers, uh, the woman was pursuing her Ph.D. in Christian theology, so she was sort of my translator for the class if they needed it. Most of them didn't need it but kind of wanted it, you know what I mean? I mean, because English was like their third or fourth language for some of them. So they spoke it, but, you know, just to make them feel comfortable, she translated most of my stuff. She and her husband, this wonderful, big, giant Russian fellow named Alexei, Alexei, great Russian name, they were with us. And so we took this... We did our stuff in Moscow, and we took this 10-hour overnight train that we felt like we were going to prison. No, uh, this overnight train with my boys, you know, not sleeping, and I'm trying to cram into this little train car, and it's just brutal. 10 hours to St. Petersburg, right, uh, up the Russian coast, toward the Russian coast by the Black Sea. We get out. It's six, we, It was an overnight train, so it was 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, guards with machine guns at the thing, you know, we're checking our passports and our papers, and we're just not in the mood. And so we get to get out of the train station. We're about to cross a busy intersection in Moscow, in mean, St. Petersburg, which has 4 million. Moscow has 13 million people. St. Petersburg has 4 million. I mean, it's a big, big place. Beautiful place. St. Petersburg is. Moscow, not so much. But St. Petersburg, beautiful place. But big, giant streets, and uh, we're going to walk across to where our hotel is going to be. And our guide, guides are, are there with us. In fact, the woman was with us in Moscow. She took the train with us, and then uh, her, we were meeting her husband, who was going to walk us to our hotel, and then they lived kind of up the block from the hotel. Anyway, in the park. So we get there. And, and guys, there's like a thousand people. I, I bet there are maybe 500 people waiting across the street at 6:30 in the morning, because nobody drives there much, which is probably smart because it's terrible driving. Anyway, um, I have some funny stories about that, but I won't tell you that. But anyway, um, so we're waiting, and there's like 500 people there. 
and the light turns red, right? You know, the crossing light, which they have there, turns red, and 500 people start walking across the street. And I'm looking at our guy, and he's like, go, go. So we're, I'm like driving my kids, like, okay, I guess we're going. And I said, you know, hey, where I come from, <laughs> you know, when it's red, you don't go. He goes, oh, people don't, people don't, they just ignore that. Because there's so many, they're in a hurry, they just ignore that. It's normal, Charles, it's normal, don't work. And I'm like, well, what if a truck's coming? And he looked at me and he kind of winked, he goes, which one is bigger? <laughs> I said, well, you know, he goes, well, then we stop. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so all that is to say... Um, it was a very power-based way of, of, of crossing the street. You, you know what I mean? It was a very power-based way of living. It was a very, yeah, We had another incident where, where there were people gathered on a, on a, on a grass, grassy knoll area, and there was a sign there in Russian. I said, what does that sign say? And my guy looked at me, winked again, he goes, keep off the grass. <laughs> like, ah, you guys, what's going on? And he goes... Uh, you know, and so a little officer guy who looked about 20 years old, I'm sure he was older than that, looked like I could take him though if I had to. But anyway, he, he walked out and just started yelling something in right, oh, we weren't on the grass, because we obey signs. But anyway, I'm teaching my children here, and I see 300 people on the grass. Anyway, the little guy comes out, a little cop or whatever, and he's like, blah, 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 says something in Russian. They all leave. The cop leaves. Five minutes later, there's 500 people on the grass. And I look at my guy, and I'm like, hey, what, what, what's this? You're going to get in trouble? He goes, there's more of them than him. So they're on the grass. There's no way you could arrest all of them. So it's just a very power. I'm not making fun of Rush. We had a great time there. But it's a very sort of power-based way. Well, look, Jesus is saying, be careful of... of of sort of buying into this power-based way of living because eventually something bigger, something more powerful will come along and will stop what you are trying to do. And it will cause what you're trying to do to crumble. What's the alternative then, he says here? <clears throat> we are to be people who are not just find our, we don't find our purpose in the powers of this world. We find our purpose in living out the sacrificial love of the kingdom. Okay? And apparently, Jesus begins to demonstrate throughout his life, and certainly in his resurrection, right? He demonstrates that this love that God gives through his spirit, through Jesus, is more powerful than even the most powerful thing we can imagine, which is death. How about that? So the greatest powers of this world will eventually crumble and will end up in death. But those who live out their lives through the power of the love of God will even defeat death. So that's the first thing. Final thing is this. So, so don't, don't fall for false powers. Follow the signs that Jesus provides. And the second thing is, uh, it's found, look, right here. He says, you know, many will come in my name. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end will still come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against, against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. So don't follow the wrong kind of power. And here's the final thing. Don't be led by fear. Don't be afraid. How many times do we hear Jesus saying, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Why is that? Because when a life is driven by fear, it's a reactive kind of life, right? There's no proactive kind of moment where we're reaching out in love. Lives built on fear are always just responding and never moving forward in grace and in love and in compassion and reaching out and extending ourselves in humility and in even risk for the kingdom because we're always living in fear. My concern, folks, I'll just tell you as a pastor, is a lot of messages about last things like the end times are all fear-based. 
I mean, it sells books. <laughs> it really does. But, but Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not telling you all this so you'll be afraid. I'm telling you all this is going to happen so you don't have to be afraid. See the difference? All these wars, rumors of wars, all these they're scary, yes. They're coming, but you don't have to be afraid. These are the beginning of birth pain. Now, I looked up that phrase, and apparently that phrase was used by rabbis of his day to talk about the suffering that people were going through. They all, uh, not always, but many of them in the ancient writings, you see this reference to birth pains. Well, I mean, I've never given birth, but I've been there when my wife did. And, uh, you, you know, some of you have, maybe all of you, I don't know. But um, apparently, right, I mean, I've had my hand squeezed to the point where almost breaking. My wife's smaller than me. But man, she's got a grip. I learned the hard way. Honey, just hold my hand. You'll be okay. Well, I wasn't okay. <laughs> honey, you're break. Honey, I play guitar. You're, I, you're breaking my hand. Uh, oh, sorry, dear, but it hurts. Okay, I get it. Just hold my hand, but try not to break it. Right? Uh, bird pains hurt, but the pain produces life. That's what the rabbis would say. They would say the the pain is is horrible, but the result is life. So Jesus is sort of photocopying the, the phrase that they would be familiar with. These, remember this phrase, guys? He's saying, these are the beginning of birth pains. And they all, look, we weren't there, but they all kind of nodded and went, oh, okay. Okay. I mean, birth pains are painful and tough, but the end is life. Um, the goal of the birth pains is life. Um, so Jesus is saying that to them to say you don't have to be led around by fear even when these fearful things start to happen that gives me hope right? that's some good news isn't it? I, I like that I, we, we live in a very fearful world and, and look not all fear is bad I mean I'm kind of afraid of rattlesnakes to be honest with you I grew up around too many of them in East Texas, or you know, they wrapped around your bicycle pedal and stuff. I, I don't like that. To this day, I'm not even, you know, we, and you know, my wife and I, I mean, we wanted to educate our children. We take them to these reptile gardens and stuff. And of course, they, they're holding these snakes of all kinds. Like, hey, you want to hold snake? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I want snakes to be away from me, not. Of course, my kids are like, yeah, we'll hold them. They're like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, good. Now keep it away from me. Because I, I just don't like them. I'm sorry. I know God created them. I just don't like snakes, okay? I don't. I don't like them. Some fear is pretty good, though. Some fear is okay. I mean, not all snakes are poisonous. But I go ahead and keep them at a distance just in case. Right? And when I hear that rattle, which I, I can... Look, if you've ever heard a rattlesnake rattle in person, you will never forget it. It is just this... I mean, again, growing up in Texas, you hear this... I mean, it's not pretty. You just... You immediately freeze. I remember walking through the fields with my father, hunting, and he would go, stop. And I learned that when he said stop, I would stop. And he would go, listen... <laughs> and honestly, one time, and I told my I told my kids the story because they asked me one time, Dad, why are you so freaked out by snakes? They were eight years old. Uh, and I told them this story. I shouldn't have probably because it probably freaked them out a little bit. I said one time, your granddad and I walked through a field, and he said stop, and I obeyed. I stopped. Now that was a good part of the lesson. Uh, and he said, then what happened? Well, I heard this this rattle sound. And then the next thing I knew, I heard, boom, really loud. Because my father had taken his gun and shot the snake. It was right beside me. They thought it was cool. Their mom was like, Charles, you're freaking our kids out. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> some fear is okay. It's a healthy fear because it keeps us safe. But Jesus is saying we don't have to live our lives that way. Right? I don't have to walk around in constant I don't have to walk around uh, 
just living my life as if everything is going to crumble and hurt me. Jesus says, these pains that we experience, these fears that we have, and even the pains that result from them are birth pains. They're like they're more like birth pains than they are death pains. Get it? They're more like the thing that precedes, pre precedes life than they are the thing that precedes death. So, so, number one, I don't have to chase the wrong kind of power and rely on that because that's the wrong way down the road. Secondly, I don't have to live my life in fear all the time. Now, look, I can be cautious. I need to wear masks. I need to, you know, when it's time. I need to get vaccinated when it's time. I need to not play around with rattlesnakes. I need to be, I need to be cautious. But I don't have to live my life in fear. See the difference? Why? Because all these fearful sounding things, the wars, the rumors of wars, the, the, the earthquakes, the horrible things that happen in our world because we live in this kind of world. Really, in the ultimate scheme of things, are just birth pains. Preparing us not for death, but for life. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let us go. I'm a little too excited about this today, but... Um, I mean, I remember, I'll, I'll close with this. Jesus goes on to say, by the way, you'll be persecuted at times. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be brought before governors, he says in that next section. You'll be brought before people asking you to give account of why you follow me. And it'll be scary. But even then, he says, even then, you don't have to be afraid. This is all about the coming of the kingdom. Paul lives this out, by the way. One of the examples of people who lived this out in the New Testament, who fulfilled this prophecy of Jesus, is Paul. Paul gets called before Caesar for his preaching of the gospel. And because he, gets, he actually appeals to Caesar and gets taken all the way to Rome, and you know what happens? Some, even in Caesar's household, become Christians who would have never heard the gospel probably unless Paul was sort of persecuted and made the answer before Caesar. He's fulfilling what Jesus is saying in Mark 13. When people call you to account, even when they're rough on you, when they make you say, tell me why you're doing this, go ahead and tell them. Don't live in fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, what if it cost my life? For some people it did. But here's what it also did. There's this great um, early church uh, historian named Tertullian. And Tertullian wrote this history of the early church and one of his phrases was the blood of the martyrs became the seed that grew the church. How about that? That's Mark 13. Tertullian writes this to Christians of his day to say, don't, don't be afraid of that. Don't live in fear. Don't follow the wrong kind of power. That's just a shortcut that will end up going the wrong way on a one-way street. <laughs> Instead, live your, live our li let us live our lives in confidence in the work of Christ, confidence in the kingdom, sacrificial love instead of raw power, because ultimately this is what leads to life. Let's pray.